on week two of a series that we are going to be riding all the way through the summer that we're calling Seven Ships. Seven Ships. Say that three times over and over. (laughs) And so we are going to be looking at some epic boat stories in the Bible. Uh, So we're going to be looking at some epic boat stories. Last week, uh, probably the most famous boat story in the Bible, Jesus um, comes walking on the water to the disciples. Peter walks on the water. Incredible story. Uh, Today we're going to be picking up with another famous story. Most of y'all probably know a man named Noah. Uh, So Noah built a boat. As far as I can tell, it's the first mention uh, of a boat, the first boat ever built in the Bible. Devil doesn't want this message to come out this morning, y'all. All All right? He's fighting it. No, No, anyways. First boat, first boat in the Bible ever built, and, and honestly, the, 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 it's, it's called the ark, right, Noah's ark, and so you, you really can't even call this thing a boat. I mean, not only did it take faith to build this, it took faith to get into the, to the ark. Um, just to give it to you like a, a, in perspective of how big this thing was, it was a football and a half in length. So 100 yards, so football and a half in length, football field. Uh, and, and, and so football field and a half, that's 150 yards, right? Football field and a half long. So it, it's, they give the measurements in cubits, so you've got to, like, transfer it to, to yards. The Old Testament, they use cubits. Five stories tall. But here's the part that I did not know about the ark. And, and then this, this ark, I don't, I'm not going to call it a boat, it didn't have a propulsion system in it. And no way to, you know, there was no way to, to move it, to row it. It had no rudder, right? If you've been on a boat, you know you got to have a way to steer that thing, you know, or, or, or a boat or any kind of board if there's no rudder. And so the ark, not only did it take tremendous faith to build this massive giant boat, but it took a lot of faith to get on it. Imagine that. Not only, you know, this Noah builds this massive ship and there's nothing like this has ever existed on the planet at this time but he has no way to steer it he's in the desert he has no he doesn't have any you know nowhere to put this thing and then he has no no way to really make it go (laughs) and so Noah just knowing that Noah was a man of faith and that's why he made it into the Hebrews hall of faith and so instead of reading the, the the whole account of Noah's ark that's Genesis 6 7 8 so we don't have time to go through all of that. I want to give you kind of the, the Twitter synapse, synopsis of, of Noah's life. If, if we could summarize Noah's life in a tweet, that's Hebrews 11.7. And the Hebrews Hall of Faith, and there's a lot of guys mentioned in that book. But it says, Noah, one verse, summarizing Noah's life. By faith, Noah, when he was warned about things yet seen in holy fear, Come on, holy fear, right? He built an ark to save his family. And by this, by his faith, the whole world was condemned, and he became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. And so to summarize Noah's life, he built an ark, he saved civilization, and he did all of this by faith. Now on the side, Noah was a preacher, there's a lot about Noah, I found out. And so Noah had one sermon, three words. It's going to rain. Okay, that was it. Three words. Took him 120 years to build the ark. And I, I just got a picture that he would work all day, and then he would head into town with this three-word sermon. It's going to rain, y'all. You know, maybe four. Maybe he added a four. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. And so he, he, he broadcasted this. He, he let people know that Rain was coming. There's two mentions of Noah in the New Testament. Jesus mentions them, and he's mentioned in the book of 1 Peter as well. What's pretty amazing is that both of these mentions of Noah talk about what it's going to be like in, in living in the last days. So the end, is, I think the way that God kind of works this thing out, if we could look at a timeline, right? God is, God is omniscient, so he's all, he's, he, he knows everything, and he's omnipresent. And I think he can look at this world and he sees it as a timeline. We see it in the moment. He sees this finished timeline. 
And so we look back and we kind of get chapters and we, we can see history, but we can't see forward, and God can. And so the end of the age was coming for Noah. What I mean by the end of the age was life as they knew it was about to change. I didn't know any of this stuff, honestly, until I started studying about Noah. But we have about 6,000 years of biblical history here, about 6,000 years. And from Noah to Adam is 10 generations. So where, where the Bible picks up as the first human in the garden, the Garden of Eden, 10 generations. So 10, and then we have Noah. And in that day, people lived a really long time, y'all. Okay, insane. Noah lived to over 900 years old. Is that wild? He was over 500 when he had his first kids and started building the ark. Some of y'all had more experience in here. You think God's done with you. Don't give up yet. 500 years. You know, there's, and there's a lot of explanations behind. You can find so much around why that happened. But, you, you know, God told Adam and Eve, if you eat of this tree, you're going to die. And they ate of the tree and they didn't die immediately. But God designed us to live forever. And as that, that wonderful testimony was shared this morning, we're not meant to carry death. Where we're not meant to even see death. And so at the fall, death enters in. And so a lot of scholars believe that from that moment, people just started living less, like their, the length of their life got shortened drastically at every generation. And so in the Old Testament, it was, it was, it was you know, um, I think the, is it, uh, Oh, Lord, I can't remember his name. Oldest guy that ever lived, 980 years, something like that. There we go, Methuselah, that's right. Thank you. Somebody knows their Bible in here. <laughs> All right. Methuselah lived like, that was, that was Noah's grandfather. Lived 980 years, and, and amazing. And so another piece of all this is, is in that time before the flood, there was no rain. And, and so the, the, the whole earth was watered by underground springs. That was when, you know, underground water vortexes that watered the earth. I heard some versions that, that God just put a dew on the earth every morning and it watered everything. But, but what I love about reading the history of the earth and in that day and what it was like, I mean, it's the most incredible garden, the most lush garden you can ever imagine. And, I, and what's cool about this 6,000 years of history that we have right now, 4,000 years B.C., before Christ or so, 2,000 years A.D., after his death, if we go back to the beginning and what the garden was like, that's where we're heading. And the, the, the life that Noah was living in, and, and so living in the, in the book of Genesis and reading about this perfection, and, and when we think about heaven or we hear about heaven, you know, we can picture like these cherubims floating around on clouds shooting gold harps at each other, right? Or, or we're going to be in, in uh, choir robes and just singing the praises all the rest of eternity, you know, like we can think of heaven like it's, it's you know, we can churchify it. But I think heaven's going to be a whole lot more earth, like earth than we realize, it's a reperfected earth. It's what we've experienced now, but without the sin and the shame and the guilt and the pain and the death and the dying and the tornadoes and the viruses and, the, and all that great stuff, right? And so that is where Noah comes on the scene, but something happens. It says that God looked down, and so the earth was fairly new, 10 generations, and he said that the thoughts of everyone on the earth were wicked. I'm going to read it to you. Genesis chapter 6. This is the Genesis version of Noah's story. And it said, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the earth. It had become so bad that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was just evil all the time. Jesus talks about the end of the, the age. First Peter talks about the end of time, the end of the age as we know it. And in both places, he talks about the thoughts of men, the thoughts of women, that it was just, it was evil all the time. And so the Lord was grieved in his heart that he made man. His heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I'm going to take him out. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, it's kind of hard to read it, but it's there. He says, I, I got to start over. Whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures, they move along the ground, birds of the air. I am grieved that I've made them. But Noah, look at this. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I love that. I've always heard one day of favor is worth a thousand years of labor. Come on. 
Noah found favor in the day and hour where it was just evil all the time. And the thoughts of man, it says, were full of evil. Jesus goes on, he explains it a little bit more in Matthew 24 of what the days of Noah was like. It was violence. People craved violence. It was all of these things he begins to talk about. And, and that's when God steps in. But Noah, but Noah found favor in the eyes of God. And so a lot of people don't believe this happened. A lot of people believe that the, the account of Noah was just a story, that there was no flood, that the earth, you know, that there's no evidence of a flood happening. I have people ask me that. Do you believe that, you know, that this, this actually happened, that these stories are real? I do. I heard about a little girl. She was at school, and she wrote a paper on Jonah. And she talked about the life of Jonah, how she, you know, he was swallowed by the well and ran from God and all this amazing stuff. And the teacher called her up and said, you know, that, that story can't be true because a, a well's throat is too small to swallow a person. Well, this little girl said, well, I know it's true. Well, how about, well, you know what I'll do? She, she told the teacher, when I get to heaven, I'll just ask Jonah myself. <laughs> the teacher, teacher said, well, what if he's not there? She said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> I said, man, I like that little girl. <laughs> but I believe it's true. And what's, this is even more amazing. The dimensions God gave Noah to build this boat, the ratios are still used today in shipbuilding. It's incredible. So God gave Noah this design to build this ark. And I think if we could summarize Noah's life in one sentence, one sentence, it would be this. One person can make a difference. If we could sit down with Noah and have him up here and get a, a few minutes with Noah, I think that he would tell us that. Because I'm sure throughout his life while he was building that ark and doing everything that he had to do to get ready, it didn't feel that way. But one person can make a difference. And so just a few things that I want to give you, a few things that I, I, I see in Noah's story that he never done. Now, imagine this for a moment, that you're tasked with the most important job in the world. And I know every week I have the, pl the pleasure of speaking to a lot of incredible people. I know these are, I mean, these are, you are, are leaders of leaders, it, way smarter than me. <laughs> you have people that depend on you. Some of you have a lot of people that depend on you, a lot of responsibility. But I cannot imagine having a talk with God. And having to carry around the weight of knowing that, the, the, that civilization itself and all humanity depended on me building a boat that I don't even know what a boat is. <laughs> now think about how easily Noah could have gotten very critical. Think about how easily Noah could have became so focused on what God told him to do. I mean, I mean what's more important? Making it home for dinner or saving the world? I mean, what's more important, making it to my little league, my, my son's little league game or saving the world? Noah lived with that for 120 years. But I know, this is one thing I know that ne Noah never did. He never forsake his family for his work. And this guy had the most important job on the planet. This guy was the only one talking to the Lord. Like, he's the only one that knew at the time a flood is coming. And, and, and not only that, God told him, hey, I'm, I'm going to, I mean, we read it. The whole world's going to be underwater. But Noah didn't forsake his family in the process. And I think this is so important to, to, to stop and think about for a moment because I know that I can make a bigger deal of what I do all the time. And I, I know Noah didn't do that because not only did he get on that boat, his wife got on there with him <laughs> and his three sons and their wives. And so even in the process of building this massive ship and saving the world, keeping, keeping the you know, humans on this planet, he never let it take the place of his family. And in his tweet, right, that Hebrews 11, 7, read this. Look, this is why he was working. This is why he was building. Put it that back up there. By faith, when he was warned about things not seen, in holy fear, he built an ark. Why? Save his family. He may not have even been thinking about the world. I don't know. 
He may not have even realized at that moment the, the, the gravity of what he was doing, but he never let it take him from his serving and being what he needed to be for his family. Now, I know there's a lot of people that have to sacrifice a lot for their family. I understand that. There's a lot of people that sacrifice way more than others. But I think Noah was able to keep it in perspective. I think Noah was able to keep his family involved with what he, what he was doing. I mean, imagine that. Like, he's building this boat. Hey, kids, just listen. I'm telling you, I, I heard from God. Just, fu- I, just do it because Dad said so. That's not going to be enough. I know my wife ain't getting on no ark. You know what I mean? She'll barely go on a boat with me now with a motor. There's a good chance we ain't making it back. Okay? You know, but, but this thing... He had to have involved them in the process. He had to have told them and had some real long dinner conversations around what he was doing and why he was doing it. But he didn't leave them behind. I think that's so important to stop and think about for a moment. That Noah, probably the most important job ever tasked to man, he didn't leave his family in the process. I heard a pastor say one time, He says, you know, I don't care about being famous or my name being known. The only place that I want to be famous is in my home. And I think if we could talk with Noah's family right now, I think they'd say a lot of good things about Noah. That Noah was famous in his house first. Noah was famous in his, I want want the people that know me the most to respect me the most. So Noah, he never forsake that. He started at home. He said, I'm not going to, the second thing that he didn't do, and I love this, and, and first Peter, or second Peter draws this out, verse 5, it says that Noah, he was, a, he was a, a preacher of righteousness, and that through his faith, he saved himself, and he saved several others, right? His seven people got on the boat. And so one thing that I see with Noah's life in the process of building this ark, and in knowing that God was getting ready to turn the water on, it's going to rain, He never stopped loving his community. He would work, and then he'd put his, he'd probably get showered off, put his dress clothes on, and head to the city, and he would witness. I don't know what it looked like. I have to read between the lines here. But maybe he sat down in a coffee shop and just had conversations and said, Hey, I got to tell y'all something. I know it's never rained, (laughs) I know you've never seen the eastern sky split in the air, right? But it's coming. And so he would go back, he'd get up, he'd work all day, and then he'd get cleaned off, and he'd go to town, and he'd witness. He'd work, and he'd witness. He'd work, and he would witness. And he never gave up on that. I think that's important to to, to, to stop and think about in Noah's life, that God even told him the whole world's going to get flooded. He still didn't stop loving his community. He still, I mean, I mean I, I'm sure that he probably felt the pressure of what was going on around him. Living in a world where the thoughts of every person was evil continually. That's what, I mean, violence filled the earth is what it talks about. That, that, that there was, I mean, nobody wanted to hear about God or talk about God. It was just a godless society. But Noah didn't, like, build a compound, <laughs> Right? And, and lock himself in and say, we're just going to ride this thing out until the rain comes. He could have done that, but he didn't. He worked. He witnessed. I think the people in his life knew that he was marching to the beat of a different drummer, not by what he said, but by what he was doing. <laughs> I'm sure when Noah walked to town, they all talked about him. Oh, there's that crazy dude building an ark. Let's go see what he's like. Right? Some of you probably get the same talk. There's that person. I mean, I can't, I remember the first, first few weeks I started going to church, a lot of the people I was hanging out with thought it was hilarious. Close family, I mean, that, that just, they didn't understand what I was seeing and hearing. They thought it was silly. They thought it was foolish. I mean, I was in high school when I really, you know, my senior year of high school was when I, I became a Christian. And, and I remember, you know, coming back, and, and, and I'll never forget this, this lunchroom conversation I had with all the people that I used to party and do crazy stuff that I can't tell you about with. And I just remember the, you know, illegal stuff, okay? Not, not, I mean, it's not, not illegal stuff, no. But I, I just remember having this conversation at this table of people that I thought were my friends. And it was like I just, 
didn't fit there anymore. Got excommunicated. What I was doing was very different from what they were doing. And when Noah was walking around, I mean, I'm sure everybody thought this guy was crazy. And I know our culture is not quite there yet. But there will come a time where I think walking in the faith of the Bible is going to be the minority. And Noah was walking around with a word from God that nobody else on the planet seen, that nobody on the else on the planet cared about. And the way that he was deciding to live his life was very different from the way that the world was living. And, and, and they could see that. And I think that's okay. Do the people on your job know that you're a Christian? They probably will. You don't even have to say it. They can see it in your life. There's come, I think we've come to this point in time where, where people can know and they can sense it. And I think if we could sit down with Noah, he'd tell us, he'd probably have some stories of where he was ridiculed, of where he was set apart and, and, and ostracized because of what he believed and what he was building. But that's okay. And that's my third point that he never did. Even when the critics got heated up, he, he never, ever stopped building the ark. He didn't let the critics stop him. He didn't let the opinions of his critics stop him. And he may have had only one voice affirming what he was doing. I want you to think about that. He had his family, he had God, and a whole world of critics. I've heard it said that, you know, when criticism comes, and no matter what you do, you're going to be criticized. People are going to talk about it. People are going to want to critique it. That's one of the things I, I mean, I try to love everybody, but those people that go around and critique restaurants, you know what I'm saying? If you've ever worked in a restaurant, you know. It's like, come on, isn't there a better thing to do with your life than to be a critic for a living? I, I, you know, it, it's because, it's anyways, I, I mean, I just, I just feel like there's better ways to use your life. <laughs> but no matter what you do, people are going to talk about it, right? The 80-20 rule, no, even if you do something perfectly, 20% of the people that look at it aren't going to like it. Never going to get everybody on board. But I've heard it said that criticism, the real root behind criticism is it just gets you to stop. When criticism comes, if it's your company or towards how you're raising your family or what you're doing with your life or what you're building, when criticism really comes, a, a real critic is not going to be happy until you just give up. And I know never, you know, knowing, I know that he never listened to the opinions of his critics or took it to heart because he didn't stop. He kept building. He kept working. He kept sawing. And so in Hebrews, we're given this hall of faith. It's incredible. These Noah stepping out on faith, building this ark. But it talks about how in this life that we're, that we're living right now, that we're, we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. We're, we're, that that we're, not, we're not walking this faith journey for the first time. And that we can look back in our life and we can learn from people like Noah and we can learn from the stories of Jonah and we can learn from these people that walk by faith. And I, I think if Noah, again, was with us and could tell us and give us a few pieces of advice, one of the things that he would also tell us if he was here and could speak into our life right now is don't be afraid to stand out in the crowd. Now, don't be afraid that if your life looks very different from the life of everybody else around you. Because in Noah's day, he was the only one hammering away on a boat. <laughs> he was the only one that was getting ready for this rain. And up until that moment in time, I mean, this is what is so incredible about this story. It never rained. And I've heard it said that faith is the willingness to look foolish. And I think Noah, if we could talk with Noah, that he was willing to look foolish. He was willing to step out on his faith, even when it seemed completely silly. Even when it seemed like there's no way that this is going to happen. Noah stood out in the crowd. That sometimes to really make a difference in this life, you have to be different. We, we are called to be different. I mean, we are called to be, I think the, the word that we hear most often is holy. 
set apart is what it means. God says, I want you to be holy because I'm holy. That, that when you really start walking this faith journey, there's going to be times where you're just going to stand out in the crowd. It's not, you're not going to blend in. Noah knew what that was all about. He was willing to look foolish. He was willing to spend his life doing what he knew that he was called to do. And I think that's so, so important. That at the end of the day, it's knowing what God has called you to do and being willing to stand out and step out on faith, even if you got to do it alone. He wasn't afraid to stand out in the crowd. I think the second thing that Noah, if he could lean in this morning and give us a few more pieces of advice, I think he would tell us to never be afraid to do something for the first time. I know this sounds crazy. Never been a boat built. Never seen anything like this on the planet before. But Noah was willing to step out and take a risk. Now, I think this was a part of his DNA. Now, this is, a, according to Jewish history, it's incredible. I, I learned some, some other things about Noah. And according to Jewish history, Noah was a, he was a, he was a gardener. He was an agriculturist. Uh, apparently, he grew trees. Believe that or not, like his first job, that I, I read that, that he, according to Jewish history, he planted trees. And so when he was 120 and God told him to build a boat, he was ready. But not only that, they said he patented all types of farming equipment, like the plow and the hoe and different types of rakes. And so he was like a, he was an entrepreneur. Noah invented things. That, like he was, I, I, I think his life, according to Jewish history, speaks of what kind of person he was, that he was willing to take a crazy God idea and, and, and step out on faith. He was willing to do new stuff. He was willing to try things maybe that were a little different from, from, from what the world had seen at the time. And I, I know my life that there's the, the greatest moments, I think, of breakthrough where I felt like I was really doing what God called me to do. It was normally completely outside of the box for me. Completely outside of the box. And I, I know I tell this story a lot, but there's a version of, you know, when we started up a room, I was working at another church. And, and so at that time, I was, I, my goal was I, I really felt like I was, I wanted to be in ministry full time. I was working my job at Pepsi. Y'all know about that a little bit, right? And, and, and I had some, I was doing kind of part time ministry stuff. And I think Noah, if I could just slip this in, I think Noah was like that. <laughs> I think Noah probably had stuff going on and had all kinds of projects rolling. I mean, we know that he was a belt builder and a preacher. He, so he had multiple things going on. But there was a distinct time where I, I really felt like I, I wanted to be in full-time ministry. Upper room was just an idea. And, and the pastor I was working for, he offered me a job full-time. And he, he, I remember the conversation. He said, but, but I, I, you got to pick. You want to do that thing that you're doing out on the beach, or do you want to come work for me? And I remember I had to take some time to pray about that, <laughs> because I'd never done anything like this. This was the first time that we'd done anything. I mean, it's start an outreach above a surf shop, give away some food and surfboards, and see what happens. But I felt called to that. It paid zero. It had zero benefits. <laughs> What's the plan? Don't know. Got a six-week video series. But I'm finding that it's so important to listen to that part of your life. That it's so important to be willing to step out on faith when you believe it's what God's called you to do. And I think every person's going to have a moment like that. You probably have before. And you can look back and hopefully you can look back with, 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 and smile because you took that step of faith. You started that business. You told your boss he could take it and, and you're, you know, or whatever. No, I'm just kidding. You, could, you told him right where he could go. He could go to heaven and you're going to pray for him to get there. But you're, you're, you're go, you know, like you, you had that moment of clarity. The world's against me, but I got my family and I got a word from God and I'm stepping out. Miracles happen. When we're willing to do that. But you got to be willing. I mean, it, oftentimes, John Maxwell says it like this. He's so good at what he does. 
you got to be willing to leave all that you are to be all that you could be. It's this step of faith. It was, I'm sure at some point Noah switched from a, from a farmer to a boat builder. He had to leave some things behind, but he was willing to try it. He was willing to do it, even if it was his first time. And I think at the end of this life, when all this is said and done, we're going to stand before God, and I don't think he's going to have a, a, a behavioral synopsis of how you lived. And every time that you cut somebody off in traffic, and every time you flick somebody off, all right, just go ahead. It's all right. You've done it. It's okay. We've all gotten mad and said things and done things. We did. I, I don't think he's going to be checking off a behavior list. What I think he's going to be doing is wanting to know, did you do what I put you on this planet to do? Did you do what I called you to do? Did you do what you were supposed to do? Because everybody has a calling. Everybody has a purpose. You're not just floating around and wherever you land is where you land. I, I believe that God puts us on this planet with specific things. And I, you may not build a boat. You may not save the whole world. But you have something to offer this planet that hasn't existed before. You have something inside of you that people are depending on you to uncover and to listen and, and to be true to what God's called you to do and, and be true to who God's called you to be. Even if you're the only one, <laughs> even if you got to step out in faith and you just got a few people on your side that say, okay, let's, you know what, go for it. I would say it's better to do that than for the rain to start coming and you're looking back over your shoulder like, uh-oh. <laughs> Don't be afraid to do something for the first time. And then I'm going to land the plane with this. Because Noah, the story we gave of Noah that, that God gives us, is that he walked with God, that he was faithful. He found the favor of God. He built this boat, again, 120 years. He did this for 120 years, y'all. Imagine that. I mean, okay, even if he lived to 900 it's a tenth of his life he gave to building something that had never existed before. It's amazing to me. And so when he gets towards the end of his life, after the flood, God puts something. He says, I, I, I want to let you know and all the world know I'm never going to do this again. I'm not going to destroy the world by water. He, and he says, I, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky. It's going to be a covenant between me and me. And between man and between woman, that, that, that every time you see this rainbow, know that, that, that this is never going to happen again. But I think if we were sitting with Noah right now and we could just have a conversation with him, he'd probably tell us about his time on the ark. Now imagine the life of a hero. That seems glamorous. It should be. You know, if he, I mean, my son loves superhero movies, okay? Like, he is all about Marvel and every, I mean, he loves it, loves it, loves it, loves it. Noah was a, he's a, he's a biblical hero. He was made it into the hero's hall of faith. He stepped out on faith. He accomplished what he was supposed to do. But what did that feel like in the process? Could you imagine being on a boat <laughs> with every animal on the planet? Do you know the African elephant poops 80 pounds a day? And I know this because I have, I have zoo passes. All right, and, my, and this other thing my, my son loves to do, we have season passes to Gulf Prix Zoo, and we know these animals, right? He loves it. I mean, two, he had two of them. That's 160 pounds of feces from two animals. There were seven of them. It was work. It took way longer than he thought it was going to take. I think he would tell us that. Whatever God's called you to do, don't give up because it hasn't happened overnight. <laughs> don't give up because you've been working on it 10 years. Don't give up if you've been working on it 50 years. I think Noah would say, hey, 120. It's going to take a little longer than you thought. And I think the other thing he would say is it's going to be a little harder. <laughs> You're going to have some stinky sleepless nights. You're going to have some moments in your life where, you're, where you're, you're, there's no rainbow and all you see is, is a storms. And, and I think he might say this. I think he might tell us 
that the woodpeckers on the inside are more dangerous than the storms on the outside? I don't know. But I think he would encourage us that next time you see a rainbow, remember one person can make a difference. That your life matters. Regardless of what you do, regardless of where you're from, regardless of even the moment while you're here this morning, that's the message I feel like God was supposed to tell you this morning. Your life matters. One person can make a difference. One person did make a difference. And here's the other part. You may not save the whole world, but there's somebody in your life that's dependent on you. There's somebody in your life that you may save their world. And so at the end of the day, I think it's, I think it's worth it. I think Noah would sit down and say, you know, it's, it was a hard run. But stay faithful to what God's called you to do. I want you just to bow your head for a moment because one person can make a difference. And one person did make a difference. I just want to, if you're in this room this morning and you just feel like you're lost at sea, trying to find something solid, trying to just find a landmark, something to set your course. You feel like life has just had you overwhelmed. Jesus tells us there's a hope that he can give us that's an anchor for our soul. That when we're floating around in this life and we don't know where to go or what to do and it feels like the storms are getting worse and worse and worse. Noah had a little door, actually the only door that's mentioned on his ark and it was at the top of that boat. And so this morning, I just want to challenge you, if that's how you feel like your life is in that moment, I just want to challenge you to look up. That there was a man greater than Noah, his name was Jesus. And he built an ark, he calls it the church. And he says, if you get in that ark, you come to me, you let me be your protection, you let me be your source, you let me be your rudder to steer you, you let me be your propulsion system to get you where you need to go, you just get in the ark, you come underneath my leadership. And it's putting our faith in him, just like Noah put his faith in God. And this is a good morning to do that. And so, Lord, we just pause right here, and we surrender to you. Just make that your prayer. Just, Lord, I surrender to you. I, God, I'm looking up in faith. God, I'm reaching out to you listening for your leadership, God, looking for your guidance, waiting on that dove to come back with an olive branch. I know you're going to speak. And so, Lord, we look to you today. We just thank you for that promise. We thank you for shelter. We thank you for peace that passes understanding. We thank you, Lord, for strength, and even in the middle of the storm that you're there with us. And so, Lord, we just look to you by faith. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen.